Evangelize Me's YouTube channel. I'm Don Smith, and I'm glad you've joined us for our next edition of Preparing for the Advent. So, so far we have looked at what we believe and why, that uh, Jesus told us himself that he was coming back gloriously at the end of time, then angels told us, and then apostles told us, and saints have told us, scriptures tell us, catechism tells us, so there's no doubt that Jesus is coming back. And then we spent uh, one week looking at the events around that, the idea of the rapture and uh, Jesus appearing uh, gloriously in the sky and uh, us, uh, you know, meeting him in the air if we're still alive or having our bodies resurrected. Um, and then uh, we looked at the idea of the thief in the night and discovered that uh, even though that scripture is used a lot, the thief in the night, and um, um, no one knows the day or the hour, it's very clear that Jesus wants us to understand the seasons that we live in. And that uh, Paul tells us very directly that it's not a thief in the night if you are expecting him. And so the key, of course, is to expect his return, and then it won't be a surprise. And so finally, we, uh, we arrive at uh, you know, this idea of what happens before he comes. <laughs> and so there's four things in the catechism. Um, and the, in this section of the catechism begins with this second coming could be accomplished at any moment. Right, and so, uh, you know, we can look at these things and say, "See, he can't come back." And it's like, well, yeah, he can, he can come back anytime he wants to, um, and so, at any moment. Uh, but there are four things that are talked about in the scriptures and the catechism uh, that are uh, things that should precede his coming. And so, the, they are the conversion of the Jews and the great falling away and the great tribulation and the Antichrist, the coming of the Antichrist. So we're going to take a look at each one of these uh, very briefly. could spend an hour on each one of them. We're doing all four in less than an hour or so. Uh, we're just going to touch on them just so that we're familiar with them and the ideas around them. So the first one is the conversion of the Jews. And this is, uh, you find this in the Catechism where it says, The glorious Messiah's coming is suspended at every moment of history until his recognition by all Israel. Uh, and it's kind of interesting wording there because it's like suspended at every moment, right? Like it could happen at any moment, but it's 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 on hold, right? It's like a like a dam being holding something back. Um, his recognition by all Israel, and that's a you notice that's in quotes because that's from a scripture from Paul in Romans chapter eleven that we'll look at, <clears throat> and it says, "I do not want you to be unaware of this mystery, brothers." so that you will not become wise in your own estimation. A hardening has come upon Israel in part, until the full number of Gentiles comes in, and thus all Israel will be saved. So Paul's saying this, uh, you know, the nation of Israel is God's people, right? And so uh, it's not like they have been left out of the salvation process, but that uh, God has hardened them, that's, that's how Paul says it, um, until the full number of Gentiles comes in. So God, in, in this big picture, God is collecting a family, right? And I'm, I'm, I'm happy that he's collecting a family because my family gets to be a part of it, right? And so I look and say, it's like, oh my gosh, you know, like because he delayed, I can be part of the family. Because he delayed even more, now I have children who can be part of the family. Now, and after he delayed some more, now I have grandchildren who can be part of the family the eternal family and share eternal life with them. How exciting is that? And so, so God is collecting this family <clears throat> and it's on hold until um, all Israel will be saved. Now, I want to make a distinction here between the nation of Israel, which is a secular political society <laughs> located in the Middle East. That's the you know, Israel. The nation of Israel is not the same as God's people, Israel. And that's important to distinguish, right? Uh, it's, it's the same thing with, um, you know, church. You know, we talk about the whole church. It's like, well, uh, sometimes you have people in the church who aren't part of the church, and sometimes you have people outside the church who are part of the church. And so, so we would look at it like, like the church is when, the, you know, like that's, that's when er, those are people who go to church, right? And it's like, mm, like yes, but there's, there's some other stuff there. And it's the same with the nation of Israel. 
I mean, there are Jews who are atheists, right? And there's also Jews who are looking for the coming of the Messiah. <laughs> some of those are God's people, and some of them aren't. And so this all Israel, who knows what that means? <clears throat> it says, uh, and so why do they have this special place? And Paul goes on and he says, in respect to election, they are beloved because of the patriarchs, for the gifts and the call of God are irrevocable. So the idea, of course, is that uh, God made promises to Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, to, uh, to David, and that these promises, are, these covenants, are going to be upheld, and God is going to keep his promise to the patriarchs, um, and that in spite of uh, their hardness of heart, or in spite of their sin, you know, you think about the promises to David's, you know, like your son will sit on the throne and rule over a kingdom that will go forever and ever, and then David uh, commits murder and adultery um, and tries to cover it up and hide it, and so it, you'd think, oh, like, you blew it, David. But no, God made David a promise, and David, I mean, God kept his promise to David. <laughs> it's the same thing here. <clears throat> Um, and so we're not going to go into a lot of depth, but most of us aren't very familiar with uh, efforts to evangelize in, uh, in, the, uh, in the Middle East, and especially in Israel. Uh, there is one ministry that I'm familiar with, one for Israel, and it's a, uh, it's, uh, it's a very interesting ministry because they, rec they do a really good job recording testimonies from Jews who are converting to Christianity uh, and finding Jesus as the Messiah. Uh, while I was teaching this live, I actually showed one of their videos, um, but it's really interesting because they're uh, recording in English and modern Hebrew and, uh, and having quite an effect, uh, especially a young Orthodox Jew. So the next thing is the great falling away. So Jesus tells us in Matthew chapter 24, many false prophets will arise and deceive many, and because of the increase of evil doing, the love of many will grow cold. So it's very obvious from this and some other scriptures that we'll look at in a minute that deception is uh, the foundation for this falling away, that people are going to be deceived and will turn away from the truth. And so um, you think about our culture right now and how quickly uh, news stories can spread Right and how and we've when we, and we've seen over and over again, uh, you know, a news story gets spread really quickly and it's like big headlines. But then, like a day or two later, you discover, oh, that that's not really what happened after all, right? But of course, once the story's out there, it's believed by by many people. And so, um, you know, this deception began uh, actually a long time ago. Um, uh, and, and, you know, I don't, I don't want to get into next week's class too much because next week's class is where we're really doing a timeline to look at things. But I just want to give you a, a, what I think is a prime example of this. And that is uh, this, I, the idea of evolution, that Darwin's theory of evolution that says that uh, by random, unguided mutations uh, can, can explain everything, can explain the origin of life. And how ridiculous that is now, and that uh, that scientists, for the most part, know how ridiculous it is because of the um, advances in science, where you have cellular biology now. You have this understanding of the cell as as like this uh, little miniature city, right? It has a transportation system, it has a communication system, it has a waste disposal system, it has a production system, it has a quality control system. It has, I mean, like it's it's like, uh, and every one of these systems are uh, uh, performed by these micro-machines, right? Highly engineered, complex machines going through this incredibly complex process of, you know, the, you know an energy processing system. Um, and so the idea that somehow this could happen by accident, that if you take the most simplest single cell, it is highly engineered and complex and balanced and and yet uh, for 150 years 
and especially in the last 50 or 75 years, we've been telling people, hey, this is, you know, if you take any class in science, any class in biology or botany or any of those things, you are indoctrinated that this is the truth, and you're not even allowed to question it. And and so you have a whole generation, and I mean, like, even, even my generation, I can remember when I was preparing for confirmation, I asked, like, what, you know, what does the church believe about evolution? Because I believed evolution. That's what I was taught, right? And the priest, who later got defrocked uh, for abusing children, uh, said, oh, yeah, the, the church knows now that the Bible is full of myths and, uh, and that, you know, uh, that, that we don't really know, you know, how this all happened and it's a great mystery. And, and so it was sort of like, it's like, okay, so then... So the so if the Bible's not true, and then he even went on and said we don't even know what Jesus said and taught, um, but but I, I can remember making a decision then. It's like oh well then we don't we don't know like there's not we don't have to believe that God's a creator. I mean like that was the impression I had was just like oh God didn't create anything, <laughs> and so and that's the first step. Do you remember we talked about Apostle Paul last week? Said like when you don't acknowledge God as a creator, then you start this cascade of events, right? And we've gotten to that place in our society because, because why? Because of a deception that has come upon our society. And now the majority of our society embraces this deception. I, uh, I've been uh, doing some uh, parish visits for a parish here in Maine, and, um, and it's really been interesting to talk to people. And one of the things that somebody said to me, uh, a couple said to me last week that the worst thing that they did for their kids and their faith was to send them to college. <laughs> that, uh, that their kids had strong faith and strong morals and as soon as they got to college they were taught all of the stuff you know that were just highly evolved animals that uh, you know anthropology tells you you know uh, values and uh, norms in a society are culturally driven that there are no universal norms that uh, um, uh, you know, our, our emotions are just chemical reactions in our brain. I mean, like it, you have this, this whole thing that reduces the complexity and beauty of the human being to this uh, sack of chemicals, right? That are, that just happens to be here by accident. And we wonder why our society is such a mess, right? And of course, that's just one example, uh, and, and of course, the deception. So, so, so really what, what Jesus is saying here is like, you need to know the truth, right? You need to be perfectly clear, this is true, and this is a lie, right? And if you, uh, if you get those two confused, then you're going to be in trouble. And notice it goes on and says, because of the increase of evil doing, and that's one of the things that's clear in the scriptures, is that, uh, that evil will increase. And, and of course... Uh, there's a scripture that talks about evil calling, calling evil good, right? And, and we can certainly apply that to our society with the things going on with this whole gender thing. Calling something that's evil, calling it good. Um, the President of the United States last week did an interview where he said it is morally wrong not to do gender affirming uh, treatment and surgeries on teenagers. Now. Uh, now you think about almost all the states in the United States have a law that says if, if you're under 18, you can't get a tattoo, right? Because we all know uh, teenagers are stupid, and so they'd get a tattoo, and then they'd regret it later on, right? Because we know, like, you don't, you don't think clearly when you're in a teenager. You don't understand the ramifications of your decisions. You don't have, you know, this context for it. And yet, we would let a 14-year-old girl cut off her breasts, because she thinks she's a boy. Well, why would we do that? That makes no sense. It's insane. It's evil. It's evil. And we have, uh, we have our society now, a good part of our society, they all know that's good. Right? So the evil is going to increase. So this great falling away, there are some bishops and cardinals who have suggested that perhaps it's happening already. Uh, that if you look at the numbers in these last few years, and we're just going to look at the United States numbers, if you looked at European numbers, they would be even worse, right? There are still places in the world where the church is growing, primarily uh, 
parts of Africa and, and parts of Asia, parts of especially India, um, where the church is still growing. But there's large swaths of the world where there's this precipitous decline, right? Um, and so you have uh, the number of priests uh, almost cut in half in the last uh, 50 years. <clears throat> We have the number of religious cut by three quarters, right? From 172,000 down to 43,000. You have the number of former Catholics, okay? These are people who uh, were raised Catholic, baptized Catholic, uh, and and now they have, uh, they specifically say, don't identify me as a Catholic. Like, I'm not a Catholic anymore, right? And so in 1970, there were three and a half million of those. Now there is 30, almost 31 million former Catholics. And, and of course, the significance of this is that these are um, people who, for the most part, had some sort of connection to the faith and have rejected it. Now, granted, some of them might have become Protestants, but the majority of them just became people who aren't not practicing their faith anymore. So you imagine the entire population of Maine 30 times. That's how many people have left the church in the last 50 years. In fact, former Catholics is the, are the second largest denomination in the United States, right? You, see, you have Catholics, you have former Catholics, and you have Protestants. Um, that out of the, uh, you know, the whole idea of Catholics attending Mass every week, it used to be over half in 1970. Now it's down to 17% nationwide. If you look at Maine's numbers, we're closer to more like 8 or 10%. <clears throat> right? And so, uh, so even people who would still identify as Catholic, only a small percentage of them come to church. And then of those that coming to church, 40% don't believe in the real presence of Christ. So you have 31 million people who have left the church, and you have had, you know, you only have a small percentage of Catholics who actually attend Mass, and of those that attend Mass, almost half of them don't even believe the central core tenet of our faith, the source and summit of our faith, the Eucharist. So it, it, it's like, it's like, oh my gosh, this is drastic. This is, this is incredible what is happening. And like I said, this is, this is the United States, um, and that the numbers would be much worse in Europe. And so now you, uh, you come to the larger, the fastest growing religion in, in America is a, is a category called nuns. And basically the idea of nun is, uh, is no religious affiliation. So when they're doing surveys, that's an option. And so this, that's the idea of nuns. That's what they call them. I, you know, I, I you'd think there'd be better names, but and no religious affiliation. It's 20% of Americans now say they are not affiliated with any kind of faith. 20%. The, the, the horrible thing about this is that every year for the last five years, this number has increased by 1% a year. So you can, all you have to do is extrapolate, like if we continue on this path, then, uh, you know, 10 years from now, it's going to be 30% of Americans, right? Assuming that it, it stays on the same trend. But the interesting thing is that when you dig down into these numbers, um, the, the numbers are that the older generation has more faith than the younger generation. So, so this not, uh, if you went to the numbers for the people under 30, this number of non-affiliated people is closer to 25 or 28 percent. And of course that number is going to increase as well. And so you have this, um, this entire group of Americans now, a growing group of Americans who have no religious affiliation. And remember, you go back to Romans chapter 1, right, where Paul lays out, this is how this works. This is how sin works in human beings and human culture, that as soon as you uh, quit acknowledging God as the creator, then you start down this path of, of, of sin, and then the sin gets worse, and then the sin becomes a perversion, and then the perversion becomes something that's promoted and called good. And so you can see this process. It's like, wow, we are on a path, right? Um, <clears throat> and so First Timothy, Paul's writing, he says, Now the Spirit explicitly says 
that in the last times some will turn away from the faith by paying attention to deceitful spirits and demonic instructions. Now, this is very interesting, right, and scary, because it it's highlighting the fact that this is not ha ha happening like randomly, right, but that it's part of uh, the spiritual warfare where Paul says, you know, we don't fight against flesh and blood, that, that this is an action of uh, demonic spirits, right? Deceitful spirits are influencing people and that people are following demonic instructions. It's interesting that it says that people will turn away from the faith, which means that this isn't just a problem that we have in the world, right? It's not just the world who is following this deception. It says there are some who are turning away from the faith to actually follow these demonic instructions. And so that says that it's not just out there, it's also um, in here, in the church. And so you have this, um, uh, this group of bishops in Denmark, right? These are bishops. These are people who are trained in the faith, ordained to be shepherds and and leaders and teachers of the faith, and they have put forth a proposal to bless same-sex unions. And, uh, and and fortunately, the Vatican has said, like, no, no, like you can't do that. God cannot bless something that's evil, right? And so, uh, thank God. But these but these these bishops are promoting this false teaching. We have Catholic leaders who, who are promoting the killing of children with abortion, right? And, and so, and, and what that does is that it just adds to the confusion. It certainly adds to the confusion of people outside the church, but it also adds to the confusion of people inside the church, right? Where you begin to say, well, oh, like, well, if that's what the bishops are saying, if that's what these Catholic political leaders are saying, well, then I guess it doesn't matter. We don't, we don't really know what the church teaches, or, or it doesn't really matter what the church teaches. And, and of course, that will just lead more people into the deception. I hope that you're here again. This is, you need to be perfectly clear about what the truth is. That's why John Paul, in, inspired by the Holy Spirit, I believe, uh, had the, the uh, Catechism of the Catholic Church printed. You know, like if you want to know what the church teaches, we have a catechism that explicitly lays out what, what we believe and how we're supposed to live, right? And so we don't need to be deceived. This is the teaching of the church. And so we have to embrace the truth. We have to love the truth to such a degree that we're willing and able to say, no, I'm, that's a lie and I'm not going to believe it. Right? <clears throat> All right. <clears throat> so, um, so the next one, you know, because I'm just so full of good news, right? <laughs> so much good news. Aren't you, are you loving this class so far? So, um, so now we're going to move on to the tribulation. <laughs> you know, it's, it's, it, it, you know, I, I want, I want to just take a second here just to acknowledge, uh, this is terrible stuff, right? You know, you read about this, the tribulation, you read about the great deception, you read about the antichrist. It's pretty, pretty scary. But then you just have to remind yourself of something. You have to remind yourself that, uh, that our God knows the end from the beginning, that our God is, um, you know, the, uh, uh, the, the, the Lord of time, the Lord, he knows the end from the beginning, that he's uh, in charge and in control of all of these things, and that there's nothing to be afraid of, because that is, he is our King and Lord. And so, jumping right in, the uh, Catechism says, before Christ's coming, the church must pass through a final trial that will shake the faith of many believers. So again, you have this idea of, uh, okay, um, this time is coming. And, and so, first, first of all, of course, I have to be prepared. I have to know what the truth is, and I have to be ready to, to pay whatever price I have to pay to be able to follow that truth. But I also 
you know, like, I'm probably going to be fine. He might, you know, if Jesus comes back in the next, you know, 10 or 15 years, you know, like, well, that would be awesome. I'm ready. Uh, but if he doesn't, then it's my children who have to have faith. It's my grandchildren who have to have this clear understanding of, of truth and lies and what is, uh, you know, what's going to be at stake. In, you know, eternal life is at stake by what you believe and what you don't believe. <clears throat> And so you go back to Matthew 24, that whole chapter is, uh, you know, Jesus talking about his second coming. He says, for at that time there will be a great tribulation such as not been seen since the beginning of the world until now, nor ever will be. Okay, so uh, as human beings, we've gone through some horrific events, right? There's been horrible things, there's been genocides, there's been wars. Um, and Jesus is saying, compared to the great tribulation, we haven't seen anything yet. All right, we, that's that's a that's enough to kind of uh, make things kind of scary. But again, he's telling us. Why is he telling us? He's not telling us to scare us. He's telling us so that we can be prepared for it, right? Um, <clears throat> so Paul describes these last times. He says, "Understand this: there will be terrifying times in the last days." <laughs> you couldn't say it any more bluntly than that, right? Uh, uh, you know, the idea that uh, there's a scripture that I didn't include in here where it talks about, um, you know, men's hearts will stop, you know, because of anxiety in these last days. And so the idea is like, okay, uh, if you know you're going to be facing something scary, then you can be prepared for it and you can uh, build up your faith so that you're able to get through it, which is why we have these scriptures. Uh, Paul describes what people will be like in the last days. People will be self-centered, lovers of money, proud, haughty, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, irreligious, callous, implacable, slanderous, licentious, brutal, hating what is good, traitors, reckless, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, as they make a pretense of religion but deny its power, reject them. Now, it's very interesting because Paul, I mean, uh, Jesus says it's going to be like in the days of Noah, right? So people are going to be marrying and giving in marriage, and so you'd think, well, that doesn't sound very terrifying, right? But it's, uh, the, I, <laughs> it, it's not going to be terrifying for people who are embraced in the deception, right? It's going to be terrifying because of their reaction to Christianity and Christianity's claims about knowing the truth and knowing how to live in a right way, right? So it's going to be terrifying for us because they are going to hate what is good. They're going to hate the truth. They're embracing darkness and rejecting the light. And so if we are in the light, remember Jesus said, you know, like, <laughs> you you're taking up your cross and you're following me. But like we, we are going to be going through. In fact, um, oh shoot, I didn't include it. Uh, part of the description in the catechism is that the church is going to go through its own passion, its own crucifixion in these days. Um, and so, so we all know that the church has suffered persecution in the past. And, and the difference in, in the Great Tribulation is that this is a worldwide phenomenon, right? Which is, which is very interesting because it's, uh, you know, when you think about worldwide events, uh, it's only been in the last um, little over 100 years ago we had World War I, right? So it's significant that we'd have this, uh, this um, you know, this requirement, this idea that the persecution is going to be worldwide. If you look at uh, where persecution is in the world now, uh, it basically falls into three ca categories. You have the uh, communist countries where Christianity is uh, highly restricted and controlled. Um, the Vatican cannot appoint bishops in China without China's government approving them, right? So in China, there is still a huge underground church because the official church in China is highly controlled by the Communist Party and infiltrated by the Communist Party, right? And so, so this idea that uh, uh, under communism, your faith is used against you, right? When the, when the Soviet Union took over, um, uh, you know, Russia and all the surrounding countries, 
um, they just claimed all the church property, right? So, so you know, one Sunday you go to church in your church, and the next Sunday, uh, if you want to go to to a mass, then you'd have to go to somebody's barn or maybe uh, you know outside in the woods someplace, right? That you couldn't meet in the church buildings anymore because they, the state had taken them over. I mean, instantaneously. Um, and then, of course, they use uh, all kinds of incentives to keep you from believing. So at one point in time during the Soviet Union, if you had your children baptized, then they weren't allowed to go to college, right? So the idea was, like, we're going to punish you for, uh, you know, for having faith. And, of course, you know, the alternative is to not have faith. And so that's, uh, that's certainly a possibility, right? Uh, in Muslim countries, in, in many Muslim countries, it's, uh, it might not be illegal to, um, to be a Christian. You can be a Christian, but you cannot demonstrate or show your faith at all. Uh, and so, like, you can't have a necklace with a cross on it. You can't have a t-shirt that has uh, a Christian symbol on it. You can't talk about your faith. Uh, Muslims who convert to Christianity uh, are, are killed in lots of countries, right? Uh, there's also a special tax in Muslim countries that if you're a Christian, you have to pay more taxes because, uh, you know, because you're a burden to society, I guess. Um, <clears throat> and then finally, uh, we have secular states. And uh, these secular states, uh, you know, whether it's in, uh, whether it's a communist one, the Soviet Union, or whether it's a Nazi regime, have been the most brutal uh, institutions uh, in the world, and more people were killed in the 1900s uh, than at any other time in human history. And almost all of them, millions, millions of people under Stalin, under Hitler, and under uh, the Chinese government, um, millions of people were executed. And so we can look at these situations and we can say, okay, like, uh, I can already see how this is working in the world, so it's a question of like, what does this, what, how, like, what does this look like if it was to become something worldwide. And, um, and the Catechism says, the persecution that accompanies her pilgrimage on earth will unveil the mystery of iniquity, right? Uh, that's, again, you see those quotes, that's a quote from Paul. In the form of a religious deception, offering men an apparent solution to their problems at the price of apostasy from truth. Okay, so, so part of this deception that is going to come in the last time is that we're going to be offered a solution to our problems that is apart from God. That that uh, actually it's not just apart from God, but it's contrary to God and His truth, right? And so you think about okay, so what we need is a worldwide crisis, right? And so if we had a worldwide crisis, then we need a worldwide solution. So it, it's very interesting. Um, uh, there's a book, a series of books called the Secret Benedict Society. They're written for uh, like kids. They're kids' books. They're you know not little kids' books, but my ten-year-old granddaughter was reading them and she loved them and she's and so she's telling me about them. So I think, well, you know, like I got to read this, and so I need some nice relaxing reading to do. And so I start reading this, and I discover um, what it is is that this evil person has created a crisis and, and it's all in the news and everything everyone the whole world is upset because of this crisis that's going on and 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 this evil person has created the crisis and he is in the process of training uh, all the young people at this school he everybody thinks he's such a wonderful person because he has this school that he brings children in to train them but really what he's doing is training in an army, and, uh, and then he's going to present himself as the solution to the problem, right? And so it's like the, the creation, really, kind of like a, the Antichrist. And those four little children have to infiltrate his school and try to figure out, you know, what he's doing and how he's going to do it. And so you have, it's, this, you know, the adventure of these four little children infiltrating this. And, of course, it wasn't relaxing for me at all. Here I am looking for something relaxing to read. I'm reading about the Antichrist in the end times. So, um... So we need a worldwide crisis, and we already have a couple of those already, right? I mean, uh, nuclear, we, we're, we're on the edge. A couple weeks ago, the president said that uh, we're closer to Armageddon than we've ever, than we've been since the 1960s, right? Uh, certainly a nuclear uh, war would certainly pre precipitate some perilous times on this planet, right? Uh, and you think about 
these little hot spots we have with uh, Taiwan, with China, with North and South Korea. You know, just the news yesterday was that North Korea launched a bunch of missiles, and uh, you know, and then you have the Ukraine and the threat of nuclear weapons there. You have uh, Iran threatening to do something with Saudi Arabia and Israel. It's, it's like like you have the whole of these tension hot spots. It's just like oh, it's like it's like oh my gosh, like we're are we on the edge of World War Three, right? Uh, but then, of course, we also have climate change and the idea that, uh, uh, that, you know, that we are affecting the universe and that the end of the universe is coming. Um, I don't know if you've ever watched any of these like man in the street uh, interviews. I, I usually hate them because they're usually about political things. And so they go out on the street and they say, like, what do you think about the, you know, the, you know this proposal that Congress is doing? And they, and, so, and they interview people in the street and it's sort of like, like, who cares? I don't care what people on the street in Philadelphia think about this. You know what I mean? Like, why are we doing this? But, but this one was interesting because um, the person doing the thing went to a, a university in Boston. I don't remember which one. One of the big ones that you recognize, and and uh, and just started asking students uh, if they believed in, in climate change was real, um, and were they afraid of it, and and how long do you think it would be before uh, the end of the world because of climate change or drastic change at least because of, um, and it was fascinating because every single person was like, oh yes, I believe in science, uh, uh, climate warming, and uh, and and we might only have you know 25 or 30 years and. Um, and I'm terrified of it. It keeps me up at night. I mean, like the way that they were expressing these young people were expressing this horrible uh, fear and anxiety they have about the environment. Well, I mean, like if you raise a whole generation of people, right, with a with this uh, with a, with some kind of crisis that is coming to a head. See, the idea is to create a crisis in such a way that people. Uh, w will be willing to do anything to avoid the crisis, even throw out their faith, right? Even turn in their neighbors, even, uh, you know, like whatever, like whatever, like turn in my, like turn in my parents, my gosh, my parents, <laughs> they, don't, they don't understand this crisis thing. We have to get rid of these people. And the interesting thing is that it's the Antichrist who will provide the solution to this worldwide crisis. Uh, the Catechism says, oh no, before we go to the Catechism, we have First John. He says, children, it is the last hour. And just as you heard that the Antichrist was coming, so now many Antichrists have, appear, have appeared, and thus we know this is the last hour. Right? And so this idea that it's, just not, it's not just the Antichrist, but it's the kind of the spirit of Antichrist. It is the people who are acting in the same nature and way as the Antichrist. And John says, uh, you know, 2,000 years ago, this has already started, right? Um, and so the uh, Catechism says this, the supreme religious deception is that the Antichrist, a pseudo-Messiah, by which man glorifies himself in place of God and of his Messiah come in the flesh. And so it's, a, it's, a, it's like a, a contrary, that's the idea of anti-Christ. It's the opposite of Christ, right? <clears throat> Still presenting themselves as the Messiah, as a Messiah for the nation's, uh, for the world's problems. And he says, the Antichrist deception already begins to take shape in the world. Every time the claim is made to realize within history, within history, the messianic hope that can be only realized beyond history through the coming judgment. Right? So you have uh, this deception is somehow we're going to have utopia on this planet. Somehow by our actions, by man doing, making the right decisions and doing stuff, we can finally have uh, the things that we long for that, that we know as believers, we can only have those in heaven, right? We're not ever going to conquer all diseases. We're not ever going to conquer death. We're not ever going to have uh, peace and prosperity for the entire world in equity, right? Uh, and equality. We're not going, I mean, like, we're not going to have those things in this time because we recognize mankind is affected by sin. But that is the hope that is going to lead. So you have this combination of this terrible crisis and you have this promise of, of heavenly stuff. 
And that is a powerful combination that the Antichrist will use. So there's one other thing. We haven't spent a lot of time in Revelation because Revelation is just full of imagery. I mean, you could, you could just do a whole study on Revelation. It's a fascinating book. And so you have, you know, beasts and angels and bowls and scrolls and famines and plagues and, you know, women with crowns and you get all this stuff, right? But there's one, one thing that I wanted to highlight, then, and, and this is an important part of the last days, is the idea that uh, there's a controlling of buying and selling. Okay, so there's a, yeah, you know, it, it's the mark of the beast, right? Um, and it says that unless you have the mark of the beast, that, uh, that it, it, you know, and of course we don't know what that means. We know that the people of God are marked, right? We are sealed. Uh, there's a description of the, the, uh, the seal, the invisible seal that um, the angels can see. And so this idea that somehow the buying and selling is tied with the beast and the Antichrist, <clears throat> which, which, which it has a really important portent for all of us. Because when you think about uh, our lives are all about buying and selling, right? Especially in the West. Um, everything we need for life involves buying and selling. So if uh, evil itself took over the ability to buy and sell, then that would be pretty drastic for those of us who, because of our faith, cannot any longer participate in the buying and selling, right? And so, <clears throat> so you think about how this has worked in these, uh, in these, um, in the persecution that, as we see it in the world, right? Uh, and one of the ways that you see it is in China, and it's uh, they call it a social credit system. That, and it's not uh, nationwide. They're hoping to make it nationwide, but it's in the big cities. Basically, they follow your uh, uh, your social media, your uh, your spending habits, your uh, you know how you spend your time, how well you work, how efficient you are. They follow all of those things, and they reward people who are doing what the government wants them to do by giving them lower interest rates and giving them loans and providing opportunities for them. Um, the other side. So if you criticize the government, well, then uh, you might lose your internet. You might uh, not be able to get a loan. Your interest rates might go up. You might not be able to get a job. You might not be able to get an education. So you have this, uh, this system, right, that says behave the way the government wants you to or else. So we can see that there's already a system set up on this planet in this time to be able to use the buying and selling to control people and to make people afraid. I mean, if you got to the, you got to the point where they'd say like, okay, you can't own a house if you're a Christian. How many people would say, well, I need my house. So I guess, I guess I won't be a Christian anymore. Like I wasn't really that dedicated to it anyway. Right. Um, Another way that this happens, and, and I just want to remind you of this, and, you know, again, uh, you know, it, it's not about politics, and I don't want to make it about politics, but remember at the beginning of COVID, um, and especially when the, uh, uh, when the vaccine was first being rolled out, you had this incredible fear, right? The fear of like, okay, this is a worldwide thing. Uh, lots of millions of people are going to die. It's going to be horrible, and uh, and it spreads. It's an airborne virus, and and so um, we instituted this uh, this vaccine mandate in lots of different industries and in lots of different contexts where you had people forced to receive uh, a vaccine that hadn't been fully tested, uh, hadn't been like long-term effects. There's no way to know because it's brand new. I mean, like all of these questions, legitimate questions that people have that even doctors had about like, is this the right thing? But, but because of the fear, right? And again, I'm going to just go back like the fear causes people to make decisions. And so there was a time when there was a survey done 
where it said nearly half of Democrats said that if you're not willing to get a vaccine, you should, you should be fined, and maybe you should be, even be imprisoned, right? What were they doing? They were responding to this crisis, right? And the solution to the crisis that was presented to them was everybody get a vaccine, and that'll make the crisis go away. Now, now we know uh, the vaccine doesn't prevent you from getting the disease. It doesn't prevent you from spreading the disease. And, and yet, at the time, because that was the solution presented, it was like, you either do this or we're going to put you in jail. Do you see how quickly and easily this could be. If you created a crisis, a worldwide crisis, and you deceived people into thinking that you had a solution, Mr. Antichrist has a solution, then because of the fear and the deception, everyone is going to follow him. That's why we need to know the faith and be ready to do whatever we need to do to keep our faith. Jesus says, the one who perseveres to the end will be saved. So next week we're going to be looking at what does this, you know, like where are we in this process? What does it look like, right? Now, what does it look like in our time? And then, of course, the final week will be like, okay, what do we do with all of this information? But I want to end on this note. I want to just end with this uh, encouragement. That our Lord... Jesus Christ has been given the name above all names, that at the name of Jesus, every knee is going to bow and every tongue is going to confess that he is Lord. That is our God. He is in control and we can trust him because he loves us. He has sacrificed his life so that we could be part of his family and he's going to take care of us. He will provide the grace and strength and wisdom we need. But he does tell us, be prepared. And that's what this is all about. God bless you. I look forward to seeing you again next week.